Welcome to Zephyr's Travels and greetings from Kansas. This week we go to a very unique museum that's 650 feet under the ground. We go to where the West began and we visit a pizza hut that doesn't serve pizzas. We start our adventure in Wichita, Kansas at the Wichita State University. We're here in the world famous Pizza Hut Museum on the Wichita University campus. And this is the original building, but it was moved to this location to inspire students to try to achieve anything, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's kind of cool. It's just, it's just a small little building that was probably, you know, um, the two brothers who started Pizza Hut opened up. Um, in the 70s with $600 loan and you know, made a huge success out of selling pizzas and became the world's largest uh, pizza franchise. We should really go through and look at this stuff first before yeah. we say what it is. Let's These are a collection of menus from across the world for different Pizza Hut. This one I think is uh, China. And then over here we have Switzerland and India. And I'm not quite sure. It's in Arabic, so I'm not quite sure what menu that would be. You can get the Pizza Hut sauce menu right here on a napkin. The Carney brothers, Dan and Frank, who started the original Pizza Hut, ran the restaurant at night and studied during the day. In the 60s, the Carney brothers asked Richard Burke to design the Pizza Hut building that is famous with the unique roof line that we see today in Pizza Huts. Hey guys! We are sitting here at the original Pizza Hut. Which is now located on the Wichita State Campus in Wichita, Kansas. Yeah, so this building is was moved here from its original location um, to inspire the students who go to the University of uh, Wichita that anything is possible. The Pizza Hut franchise was started by the Carney brothers, Dan and Frank, with a $600 loan from their mother because the building next to their family grocery store became available and the owner suggested they open up a pizza place. So they didn't know anything about making pizza and they got a friend of theirs who had worked in a pizza place who, to help them out and he remembered the recipe for the sauce but did not remember the recipe for the dough. So he went to his wife's cookbook and got the recipe for French bread and they made that, but they didn't allow the French bread to rise, so they cooked it immediately, and that's why, how they got to the, the thin crust pizza that Pizza Hut was famous for. Uh, it's kind of kind of neat. You kind of get to walk around the building here, and they've got the whole story laid out for you along the outside wall with a lot of memorabilia from Pizza Hut and a few interactive things like Pizza Hut commercials and such. So mm -hmm. it was kind of neat to walk through and see it, and it's free. Which right. is always cool, right. and apparently not very crowded today. No, we had the whole place to ourselves while we were here. Right, it is free, so um, it was it was uh, very interesting, and uh, it's it's very interesting to see how Pizza Hut started as a very small location and became ten thousand locations worldwide. Yeah, and so we're going to ask you to share your Pizza Hut memories down in the comments for everybody. What's your Pizza Hut memory? Okay. Yeah. We used to go there when we were dating. And they used to have the, the corner uh, booth 
in the in the corner we had the weird windows. Mm -hmm. It was really small. We used to sit in there a lot. Yeah, I remember going as a child too. Yeah. Yep. When they you know started expanding nationwide, and yes, I remember going there when I was a, you know a youngster into the teenage. Yeah, and we used to get pizza pizza when we first got married. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we've got a little bit of a history with Pizza Hut. It's not our go-to place anymore, but it was in a time. Sadly, a lot of the locations, or probably most locations, where we live in New York State have been closed, closed down. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's a, one of the sad parts. But when we visit other parts of the country, we do, if we have the opportunity, we will get pizza at a Pizza Hut. That's right. Yeah. You know, you can always tell when you drive by a, a building that used to be a Pizza Hut. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now they've turned it into so many other different things. That's true. So. But it's very interesting to see how far it came in the 50s and the way it was developed. The different things they used to offer, the different logos. They used to have free toys for kids. Um, the different signs as they developed. Yeah these uh, red and white checker tablecloths that they are known for, the Pizza Hut lights. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was, even though it's small, it's, it's very cool to visit here. Yeah, I mean, it's, you come here, you're only going to spend half hour to an hour, so it's just a quick little stop while you're in, uh, you know, Wichita, but for us it was a good stop because it's not the most pleasant day outside, so it was our first stop to kind of come in here and get out of the weather. Might be our only stop. Yeah, we're, I think we're going to be looking for more inside stuff to do here. Yeah, most, most of the stuff in Wichita is located outside. Well, a lot of the stuff we've seen. A so lot we're, of it. Is. We're finding something though. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's carry on to our next destination, wherever that may be. Now it's time for the Pizza Hut Show. Hey everybody, today we're going to learn how Pizza Hut makes their famous crust. Yay! That's right, Pizza Head, and here's your friend Chef Steve to explain. Oh, hi, Chef. Wait a second, he's not a chef. Sure he is. He just wants to show you how they make fitting, crispy pizza. Of course, there's Bigfoot pizza. Or my favorite, pan pizza. Well, that's all for today, kids. See you next time. Well, it's not the prettiest of days and we're probably getting water on the lens at this point, but we stopped here at Keeper of the Plains Park in downtown Wichita. And on a nice day, this would be a nice place to visit, but today it's really only a place for geese and, and ducks. The Keeper of the Plains is here on the convergence of the Arkansas and Little Arkansas River in downtown Wichita. There is also an Indian museum in this area and plus a number of other museums. So this is a kind of a destination area if you're in the Wichita area. Hopefully on a nicer day than today. But we wanted to at least, you know, get here and check it out while we could. We knew the weather was gonna be crappy today, unfortunately, and we were trying to look for some indoor things to do, but there seems to be this is an outdoor town for a lot of the stuff. It's been a couple of days since we had the accident with the Airstream and, and hit that pole. We've contacted our insurance company um, and took a couple of days, but we got a report um, opened on it so that it's going to be covered by the insurance. And I've also contacted Airstream Factory Service because I want to have the metal work and everything done there. And unfortunately, they are booked. Um, the earliest appointment we could get was going to be July 18th. And, of course, that would interfere with going to the Airstream International Rally in Maine, which we're hoping to do. So I've made an appointment for August 8th, and I've asked them if there's an opportunity to move that appointment forward to beginning of July or June or May, that I would appreciate it. Um, so hopefully that happens between now and spring. Uh, we'll wait and see. If not, you know, we can use it. Um, I did do... A, temporary repair over it with some duct tape 
just to seal it off so we didn't get any moisture inside the Airstream. You know, one of the things you don't want to have is moisture coming in through that hole, getting down and rotting out the floor. And then we'll have future problems that we all, we would have to address. We leave Wichita, Kansas and head up to Hutchinson, Kansas, which is only about an hour's drive away, where we're going to find the very unique museum that's 650 feet under the ground. Well, today we're in Hutchinson, Kansas, and this is the Kansas Underground Salt Museum. It's called Stratica, Kansas Underground Salt Museum. Yep, and we're gonna go 600 and what feet below ground? 650 feet below ground. Oh my God, that's a long ways. Yes. And uh, apparently they're gonna give us hats, so that's why I don't have a hat on. Right, <laughs> hard hats. And the tour takes approximately two hours so at the end, we will let you know how we liked it. I'm sure it will be very interesting and exciting. Yep. And this is also a Harvest Host, so this is our destination for tonight, too. So after the tour, we're just going to stay in the parking lot tonight and get our start tomorrow for our next um, adventure. So let's head in there and check this out. Okay. Stepping on the elevator, you could go ahead and move on it. All right, we're uh, descending in darkness because this is how the miners uh, did back in the day. Uh, we are going to be descending uh, three, uh, 650 feet down. If you uh, think about how tall the Statue of Liberty is, um, stack or have two of those, and that's how deep we're going into the ground. Um, if anyone needs a light, please raise your hand. When we hear uh, the beeping, we're about 50 feet from the ground, and we're almost to full, uh, uh, fully down 650 feet. Start. Watch your step this block of salt behind me is one of the most pure blocks of salt that has been found in this mine. It was discovered in 2007 in one of the sections and brought here to be part of the museum. This section of the mine is called the Narrows, and when the miners dug this section out, when it was completed, they left their mark on the wall here. This is one of the mine cars that the miners would ride in to get to the job site. This was incorporated in the 40s, and it would hold 30 people. Of course, it was probably much more comfortable with half that number, but it could hold up to 30 people in here. When this cart was purchased, it was shipped here, tack welded together on a train, then disassembled, brought down the shaft in pieces, and then welded back together down here. This is one of the vehicles in the mine that the miners would use to get around the mine. They would buy these vehicles locally, disassemble them into a small size, the size that fit down the shaft was four foot by three foot, and then bring them down here and reassemble them. Of course, they would discard anything that wasn't needed, like doors, roofs, and such. 
and they, the vehicles would run on diesel because diesel has a lower flash point than gasoline down here. It's pretty cool. Now this vehicle they found abandoned in the mine, but they currently bring vehicles down here and they last about 10 years. Now they do have to do a lot of maintenance on the vehicles as far as keeping them from rusting, so they keep them painted and everything. Um, as you can see on this one, it has started to rust quite a bit. So this is how they would mine the salt. This wall behind me here, they would come in with this tool here, which is like a giant chainsaw, and it would undercut the wall and then they would come through and you can see the red lines there. That's where they would blast the wall and the whole section of the wall would drop down allowing them to dig it out and mine it in for salt. The salt mine is also a strategic storage facility. It turns out that the climate and the lack of humidity and sunlight is the perfect conditions to store things like movie pictures and TV shows and important documents. There's also a lot of movie memorabilia down here too. Behind me it's videotape and movie reels and such that are stored by Hollywood. This is a good place to store, especially at old movies, because they do not deteriorate because of the constant temperatures and humidity that is down here. Um, most of the movies um, filmed are now being stored in a location like this. The poster here is from the movie The Mommy Nook Men. And that actually is what kind of gave the idea of using this underground storage. During World War II, at the end of World War II, the Allied forces found a number of hidden treasures in salt mines by the Nazis. And that gave them the idea that, geez, you know, maybe this is a good place to store things that could be well protected. Here's Arnold's costume for the role of Mr. Freeze from the movie Batman and Robin. You may not remember that one. That's the one with George Clooney. This is George Clooney's costume from Batman and Robin. Agent Smith from The Matrix, which is coming back out again this fall with a new Matrix with Colonel Reeves. So this is kind of cool and relevant. A Superman costume worn by Dean Cain on the TV series Lois and Superman. All right, Diane, where are we? We're at the bottom of the salt mine, or actually in the salt mine. Yeah, 650 feet below the uh, surface. surface. Yeah, this is a pretty cool little museum here. You get to wander around, they get you an idea what it's like to, what it was like to work in a salt mine, but also the fact that it's also a strategic storage place down here and a lot of things are stored. Right. And you get to go on a, a train ride through the uh, salt mine itself. Yeah, which is nice. You, know, you don't have to walk the whole thing because there's miles and miles down here. Yeah, it, was a, it was a great time. Yep. Yeah. Worthwhile tour. Yeah, definitely was. Yeah. Definitely was worthwhile. And you get to wear these neat hats. Right. <laughs> We leave our overnight stay at the Harvest Host in Hutchinson, Kansas, and on our way to Dodge City, where the West was won. the Boot Hill Museum in Dodge City, Kansas. This museum kind of tells you the history of the city of Dodge. In the beginning, the tribes of Indians occupied the land and they were the ones that inhabited it for, until the Europeans came in and more or less drove the Indians to live on reservations. Yeah, and they did that by going after the buffalo, which is what the Indians survived on, 
and the Indians would only kill what they needed, but the white men came in and pretty much slaughtered all the buffaloes. Right. In the beginning, there was several hundred thousand buffalo, and they killed so many that it was reduced the size to just a few hundred. Yeah, and this is only just over a very short number of years. After the buffalo were gone, then the uh, ranchers came in with cattle, and this became cattle land. And along that time, the railroad came through here, and this was one of the railroad stops which brought more people in to the city. Giving them jobs, building the train, the train tracks, running the trains. Yep, and supporting the people that came through this area, like the Harvey House and other establishments like that. Mm -hmm. But all that time, Dodge City was known as being a very rough city. Um, there was a fort here that was built because of the Indians being in the area and conflicts with them over time. So what started to develop in the city was a lot of saloons. Yes. Because the fort had a prohibition that they couldn't serve alcohol within five miles of the fort. And what became Dodge City was exactly five miles from the fort. And then eventually it, it developed more, which led to more people coming through and moving out west. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. I mean, you know, Dodge City is kind of like the central hub of a lot of Westerns. Um, Gunsmoke was originally set in Dodge City. Mm -hmm. You've got Wild Earp was a sheriff here at one time. Brett Masterson was a sheriff here. So there's a lot of uh, Western history in this area. Yes. Well, there's another couple parts, or at least one more part that we have to explore. And then on to the gift shop. But it really is a neat place to visit. You learn a lot of history and how Dodge City came to be to what it is today. And uh, yeah, it's, and it's located in one place, which makes it very convenient. Yeah, they have a old Victorian house here that has all the old furniture and everything in it, which is really cool to tour through. Right. They have the Union Church here, which was the first church in Dodge City. And actually, these buildings behind us, some of them actually operate, so you can actually go inside. And there's a few saloons. And there's a general store. There's an ice cream parlor. And some are closed for the season. We're here in November, but some are still open. Yeah. And there is a very nice uh, church that you can look at and go inside and explore. You can actually go into the house yep. and explore that as well. Yeah. So we're going to venture on and finish up here. Yep. All right, let's go. We're at the Dodge City KOA Dog Park, which you can see is gigantic. I want to take a minute and show you our campsite here at the KOA in Dodge City. It's a typical KOA campground. You know, the sites are fairly close. There's the neighboring site. There's nobody on it, thankfully, so it gives us a little bit more room. <clears throat> you do have a fire pit up there at the front of the site, and it's a gravel pad. This site has water and electric and cable TV. It does not have sewer, but there is a dump station on the, uh, on the way out, so we'll use that. It's, a, you know, not bad. It was uh, about $35 a night with the KOA card, so it's right in our budget range on the top end of it, but right at our budget range. So it was a good, reasonable place to stay for the night, and it was, it's right in town, so that is great. So you could literally walk in the town and, and you know see the sights or whatever. There is a park right next door um, in a dog park that we've been to. The park next door has a big playground and a zoo which is open to the public and free so that's kind of worthwhile to go there it's mostly just uh, farm animals and that type of animals but it's kind of cool we did see that there are ducks and donkeys and uh, cows and such there i think there were some um, alpacas and such so kind of a neat place and we're gonna head in for the night we'll be leaving in the morning and uh, we'll see you guys in the morning probably where we're going to end this week's video. If you like the video, please give us a thumbs up. If you haven't done so already and want to support the channel, subscribe to us and leave us a comment. We'd love to hear what you thought of the video and if you've been to any of these places. Take care, everybody. We'll see you down the road.
Thank mm-hmm. you.